Okay, um, let's get started. So uh, welcome to the Writing Competitive Affordable Materials Grants Proposal Webinar. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Tiffany Reardon. I am the Program Manager for Affordable Learning Georgia. And in this webinar, we're going to go over some of the big changes we've made to our grants programs, um, starting with the current round, round 18, and some tips for writing a competitive proposal. So we're going to start with some changes we've made to the request for proposals. Um, this year, Jeff and I sat down virtually and did a complete review and overhaul of the former textbook transformation grant program. Uh, we considered some of the issues and some of the confusion we found on proposals in the past, um, complaints that we'd had from institutional grants offices, um, and then some of the research and needs that are coming out of the national open education community. Um, so for starters, we changed the title of the grant program. So for the past 17 rounds, the grants were called textbook transformation grants because the initial purpose of the grants was to take our courses using commercial textbooks and transform them to use open textbooks instead. Over the years though, uh, that emphasis on textbooks kind of slipped away silently into the dark. Um, open educational resources, free resources, affordable resources, they come in all shapes and sizes and textbooks aren't always the solution proposed in our grants proposals. So we changed the title to reflect that. Uh, the grants program is now called Affordable Materials Grants. We also changed the titles and focuses of the grant categories. So in previous rounds, we had a category for standard and large scale grants, which were the bigger grant proposals for bigger transformation projects. And we've changed that into transformation grants which focus on initial transformations of courses using commercial materials into courses using OER, free or low cost, so less than $40 materials instead. In these projects, funding used to be structured based on the level of impact, hence the original name of standard and large scale. Now the funding is based on the number of team members needed for project success. So transformation grants have a maximum of $5,000 per team member for things like salary, course release, travel funding, um, things like that, with a maximum grant amount of $30,000 overall. Um, so there's room for additional expenses in there, like materials, um, other professional development, things like that. Um, but it does have to be adequately justified in your proposal. You want to be very clear about why you're asking for additional funding. Um, we also changed our mini grants, which were smaller grant amounts meant for smaller projects. So originally it would be like ancillary creations, updates to OER, things like that. Um, we would sometimes get like smaller um, individual transformation projects in there too. Um, so we've changed that to continuous improvement grants. So uh, which focus on continuous improvement of OER free or low cost materials and their use. So which might include ancillary creation, um, might, might include content updates, accessibility, design improvements, things like that. Um, these grants could also be used to replace currently used OER with newer or better OER. So maybe what you're using is no longer meeting your needs and you want to change them, find something else to use. Um, but it's all about improving the materials and their use. So on these projects, um, the funding has actually always been based on the team members needed for success. Um, but now the limit has been adjusted a little bit. So uh, continuous improvements now have a maximum of 2,000 per person with an overall maximum of 10,000. So it allows for larger teams than before. Uh, just as with those transformation grants, um, there is room for those additional expenses as long as they're adequately justified in the proposal. We've also changed the application system. So
so previously, transformation grants would have been done in a program called Info Ready Review, which is run by Georgia Tech. Um, now, though, we've moved all grant applications into one complete application that branches as needed. So depending on what you're applying for, it's going to change the questions that you get. Um, and we've done that using Google Forms. Um, this process, it's going to allow us to export a spreadsheet that's going to help us double check the numbers and sort your projects um, by in any way we really want to. So um, it's going to make it a little bit easier on our side. And um, having all of the applications in the same place makes it easier on you guys too. Um, the review process has also changed. So we used to do a search for new reviewers for every round, but now we're doing one search for all grant rounds in a year. So we're basically putting together a committee of sorts um, that will call on for each round instead of running a new search process every time. Um, so we also used to only use peer reviewers for transformation grants, uh, but now we're gonna be using them for all grants, including those continuous improvement grants. So previously it would just be administrative review for the mini grants, but it, with these changes, we're gonna use peer review for everything. Our old peer review rubric also used to focus on the numerical impact data. So we looked more at cost savings and students affected, and we still look at that, but now the rubric also includes a section for pedagogical impact. Um, so you wanna make sure to address that pedagogical impact um, in your proposal. So when you're um, writing your narrative, you wanna address that. And, uh, and I say finally, but we do have more. Um, this is the last official change change. Um, so the support letter has changed a little bit. We used to ask for a sponsor support letter with the idea that it would come from the office in charge of the financials of the grant. Um, but over time, we've seen a need to specify departmental leadership support. So now that support letter should specifically come from the department chair or if that department chair is named on the grant their immediate supervisor so it might be a dean it might be a provost um we also used to only require these for transformation grants um but now they're required for all grants so we also need them for continuous improvement um, and that's because we want to see that your application and your completing this project is supported by the people that schedule your courses um, and the people that make policies on using required materials and things like that. We want to want to know that they are supporting you in doing this project. So those are the big things, uh, I guess the big changes, but we've also added a few new things. So this round has new priority categories. Um, so these categories are for extra points in the review process. They are not a requirement to submit a proposal. So don't be discouraged if you don't fit in any of these categories. It's just going to give extra points. Um, so this round's categories are collaborative projects with professional support. So in this case, the project would include at least one team member outside of the course instructors, might be an instructional designer, a librarian, maybe a web designer. Um, and it's just meant to encourage collaborations with the professionals who have been shown on past grants to help produce better results. Um, another category is student participation in materials creation, adaptation, and evaluation. So this is to encourage student involvement in projects. Um, but note that this category isn't meant for student involvement at the level of just them being in the course and taking a survey. So this is more for further involvement. We want to see that uh, you have clear plans to include students in the creation, the adaptation, and the evaluation of those no or low cost materials. Um, this 
kind of student involvement increases the investment that the students have in the course, and it also increases student agency in the classroom. And those are two points of emphasis in the open education community. Um, in that in the open education pedagogy. We also have departmental scaling projects as a priority category this year, um, and these are meant to emphasize departmental commitment to implement the materials in all sections of the course across the department. And so this one also has a note. Solely the potential for departmental scaling does not qualify for this category. You should still tell us if there is a potential, but if that commitment from the department isn't there, then it doesn't get these priority points. Um, so for this category, um, the department chair's letter of support needs to express their commitment to at least piloting the project in all sections across the department. Um, upper level campus collaborations. So sometimes we get upper level course projects that have trouble getting through the peer review process because they just don't carry enough student impact. Um, so they tend to like there'll be smaller classes, maybe only taught once or twice a year. So to encourage more successful proposals for these projects, we are encouraging cross institutional collaborations. So a good example of this is currently going on at KSU and UNG, where they have an upper level geographic information systems course that they're working together to implement open materials in all sections on both campuses. So they've got a collaboration going on there. Accessibility is also a new requirement. So proposals now have to have a required checkbox so that grantees are agreeing that all revised or newly created materials are required to be developed with accessibility in mind. So specifically, we're requiring accessible document design, either descriptive alternative text or descriptive figured captions on all images, accurate captioning on all videos and transcripts on all audio, and accessible PowerPoint design. All of these accessibility requirements, have, we, we have tutorials for all of them on our website, and we do give a brief training at the kickoff meeting. So we're here, we, they, the support is there for it. It's a requirement, but we are supporting it. Um, and finally, we have an, a, a new additional letter requirement. So in order to help start conversations between teams and grant uh, or budget managers, all proposals have to include an acknowledgement letter from their grants, research, or business office, whichever one handles the grant money at your institution, stating that you have spoken to them about your intent to apply for a grant. So it really only needs to be a sentence or two. We just want to see that you have started that conversation. OK, so that's a lot, I know, and we're not done yet. But um, at this point, I want to offer to answer any questions that you might have. So I'm opening up the chat. And I know, Jeff, you've been keeping an eye on it, too, if you want to. Help me sift through them, see what I can answer. Yes, we haven't uh, we haven't seen any questions in chat yet. So anybody who has any, uh, either type them right in or you can send them through the mic. OK, cool. Awesome. Yeah, so we'll uh, give you guys a few minutes to. Ask any questions you might have about all these changes. <clears throat> Can yep, we have a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, uh, can upping accessibility for a current course OER count for continuous improvement grant? Yes, um, that is actually one of the things that we hope to see. Um, so quite a lot of our previous grants um, have materials that weren't developed with accessibility because it wasn't as much of an emphasis at that time. Um, and so we do want to see the uh, we do want to see previous grants coming back and um, making their stuff accessible. Um, we have a comment. 
that neat revisions to the grants, some definitely helpful changes with the student collaboration and departmental agreement to use the materials. Yes, I agree. Um, we worked at, we, we worked really hard to make these changes and make sure that um, they would make sense and be helpful. But thank you. Definitely appreciate including the grants office. Yeah, we've had um, we've had a few comments from grants offices um, that this is this is really going to help. I think um, that in the past we've seen uh, a lot of projects where they maybe bypass it because it's a different kind of grant, and so um, we do we are trying to change that. So. Do we have any other questions? Um, we just had uh, a comment from Barbara Tucker. She really likes the student collaboration and also the departmental agreement to use the materials. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. OK, uh, we'll go ahead and keep moving then. Um, if you think of any other questions as we go, um, you can hold on to them or feel free to put them in the chat and we'll answer them at the end. So uh, let's keep going with some tips for writing a competitive proposal. So these are based, uh, these tips are based on um, reviewer comments on previous proposals and the changes that we have made. So the first tip, make sure that the numbers in your proposal are clear. So we want to make sure that your impact numbers that you report are based on your team's commitment and not the potential impact later. You can discuss the potential impact in your narrative, but when you're actually putting, um, there's an area where you're going to put how many, the, the, the numbers of impact um, that are actually happening based on this project, stay, keep that to your commitment. Um, and then, uh, and so that's going to help us report the correct impact measures, and it helps reviewers understand the true impact of the project. So it's great to see the potential, and we want to see that, but the actual reporting should be the committed numbers. Um, when you calculate the numbers per course, you should separate the courses, especially if there's a difference in required commercial textbooks. So we see a lot of um, projects where there are multiple courses being done on the same grant. Um, it's pretty common for um, uh, departments that uh, are trying to make their degree programs fully um, OER. They'll kind of group their courses together and they'll all work together on a bigger grant instead of getting a bunch of smaller ones. And so um, on those kinds of grants, when you're working together with multiple courses, we have the air, we have the room in the proposal to separate them out, to give us the numbers separately on each course. Whereas the previous um, pre previous application asked for an average um, of all of them. And so hopefully this will give us uh, clearer numbers, but it will also help clear up um, some common points of confusion during review. And be thoughtful when estimating the time it takes to complete the tasks in your plan. So there is an area where you're going to be estimating the amount of time that you will spend on the project. It's very much an estimate, but you should really think about it and, and try to be as realistic as, pro as possible on how your how big your project is and how much time you will need to will need to and will spend on it. Um, and that'll help your reviewers as well. Tip number two, um, a little research goes a long way with reviewers. So using academic research to help show the impact that your project will have on students and to help you develop goals beyond just cost savings. Um, so that's going to help reviewers further understand the reason for your plan. Um, 
and I think it'll help you develop your plan too. <clears throat> um, and then also do some research to see what's already out there. So a preliminary evaluation of the materials available for your courses shows reviewers that you have considered your options before landing on a final plan, that you've done your research. Get to know open. So by this, uh, we mean get to know the open education community and what it stands for. So if you're planning on using open educational resources, make sure that you know what open education means and why it's important. Um, reviewers are not going to be fans of misusing OER to mean just anything that's free. We tend to use, some of us tend to use them kind of interchangeably, but they're not interchangeable. And so um, doing your research on that is also important. Um, there are some great guides out there, um, including ours, which we have on our website. It's um, linked under the help section, and Jeff has also included a link in the chat. Um, but there are tons of good guides out there. Um, if you just look into the um, the Creative Commons licensing and the um, like what the five, R, five R's are, uh, do some research into open. Have a plan for how you will host your materials open, openly. So a common thing for reviewers to comment on is when proposals only include plans to host in the learning management system. The learning management system is not openly accessible. It's only accessible by the people who are enrolled in your course and who the people who you can give access to your course. And unfortunately, no, you can't give access to your course and the learning management system to anyone outside of your institution. So make sure to include a plan for hosting openly outside of your institution's password protected environments. So if you don't already have a plan, we can help with that. So at uh, the end of a project, you can send your accessible files to us and we will host them. Um, and you should discuss that your plan to do that in your proposal as well. You should let us know that that's your plan. Be realistic with project workload. So make your timeline detailed and clear to show that the proposed work can be completed in the allotted amount of time. Um, a lot of the time reviewers um, comment on the uh, how realistic the project is. Um, and so a clear timeline helps with that. Uh, and then make sure that the projects line up with the proposed budget. And so, like I said, reviewers often comment that projects with a small budget or small teams um, but huge projects are unrealistic, so and that causes doubt of project completion and affects your review. Give the sustainability section the attention it deserves. So um, project sustainability is essential to our mission and goals at ALG. Um, so make sure that you have a plan for maintenance of materials after project completion, uh, maybe updates, things like that. Um, sometimes it's as simple as checking links every semester, and other times it means planning for content updates, expansion, maybe uh, like changing out case studies and things like that. Um, we wanna know about your plans for sustainability in those cases. And then also tell us about your plans for research and conferences. Um, we wanna see your projects making impo impact beyond the initial classroom. So if you have plans for that, you should let us know and it looks good on your review. And make sure that you're tying everything together. So everything on your proposal is connected and should be connected. So when you put something in the budget, make sure that you have explained the function of that budgeted thing in your action plan. So it might be someone's time, supplies, uh, their travel. Just make sure that it is explained in the action plan. Um, if you're planning on doing something in the action plan, then it needs to also be in your timeline. So make sure that you are defining as many milestones, meetings, deadlines, um, all of those things for task completion as you can. Be as detailed as possible. 
Um, be sure that you're addressing each of your project goals by the actions you're taking in the action plan. So um, make sure that those goals that you are addressing are also still met later um, by also addressing them in your sustainability plan. So everything should be connected. And finally, um, help ALG run the process smoothly by ensuring that your selected final semester of instruction is addressed in the timeline. Um, so you should be making sure that you have a plan to submit your final report at the end of that semester by the deadline. Okay, again, a lot of information, I know. Um, this video and the PowerPoint will be available on the round 18 request for proposals page on our website later once I get those captions squared away. Um, so let's take some time to answer some questions. Yep, so we had a, a one question in line that I didn't really want to leave hanging um, from Nikki uh, saying, uh, does ALG still support faculty using library subscription materials in these grants? And yes, we totally do. This is not uh, saying that um, we require open only, but if you're saying that you're using open educational resources, make sure that uh, you're sure that that is the case and that you know what OER are before you submit the proposal. Um, it may not make sense if you know what OER is and you're like, well, why the heck would that ever happen? But if you see like, uh, you know, students have a subscription within their accounts to use a particular thing uh, for the duration of time that they're there and you say that it's OER, well, that's a little bit of a different thing where you could revise them and remix them. And if it's all race reserve copyright, that's not going to happen. So reviewers need to know that when you're saying you're using open stuff, you're using actual open stuff. Yes, I agree. Any other questions? Um, <clears throat> Jeff, could I encourage also that they have multiple people proofread it? I've if I'm allowed to say this, when I've reviewed them, I've seen things like different classes being part of the project. <laughs> like they're not even the same pro same classes ah. when in various parts of the uh, proposal. And and then I would definitely agree with the with the um, the timeline and the amount of work. I, I I just don't think sometimes they're realistic about what they're doing or having to do. That's my yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, for those of you who are not in the know, uh, Dr. Tucker has authored an open textbook. It's one of our most downloaded ones uh, that we host, and it's in its fourth edition. Uh, so when she's saying that, she speaks from a lot of experience. Yeah, and I definitely agree with uh, making sure that you have someone proofread your proposal. Um, and alongside, along with that, um, I think it's important to not rely too much on um, starting from previous proposals. I think you should look at previous proposals for inspiration, but don't use them as templates because a lot of the time that's where mistakes are made, where you're referring to the wrong course or you're putting someone else's goals in your uh, proposal. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's good to look at previous proposals, but don't don't use it as a template. Even if it was your proposal. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that's a uh, the these two are really for any grants you would possibly uh, apply for uh, having a someone to read through it. Uh, maybe somebody who isn't in your department or somebody who isn't even in your subject area and, and seeing if they can understand what you wrote. Um, that's kind of invaluable when it comes to the final part of your creation process. Um, you know, I, I tend to be someone who edits documents for others, but when I write them, I don't catch my own mistakes a lot of the time. Uh, so there are plenty of very well-written grant proposals out there. We're not saying that that is a trend, but 
every so often I'm looking at something and there's a really good idea somewhere in the proposal had it just been proofread at least once. Do we have any other questions? <clears throat> I'm just looking through um, previous comments to see if there's anything worth saying out loud on the video. Um, because chats don't get saved. Just a new comment from Nikki saying that it was very helpful. Oh, uh, Jonathan has a question. He's typing it in. OK, no problem. While you're typing, um, I'll keep looking through these notes. Um, OK, so we have a previous note from Jeff that if you're out of town and applying from somewhere other than the United States, for example, mainland China, please consider that this is a Google form. So anywhere that Google is blocked will not allow you to apply. So make sure that you apply before you leave in that case or use a, a, a VPN. Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm sure most of us are not considering uh, even leaving the state, uh, considering how things are going right now. But just in case, if you're ever in a place that blocks Google, you won't be able to send in your application. Yeah, I agree. We've uh, we've talked about the same kind of issue in uh, in some of my classes last semester. So uh, let's see. Uh, Jeff also said earlier, um, universal design for learning is built on the premise that accessibility improvements also make the resources better for everyone. And so those kinds of plans are welcome. We want to see accessible materials and we want to see efforts to make uh, make materials like previously made materials. We want to see efforts to make them accessible. And another comment from earlier. Um, reviewers will see a plan to write an entire textbook with two people and a small budget, or they'll see what looks like a really small plan that actually requires a ton of time. So like programming, video editing, things like that. And so those time estimates are going to be really helpful. And I'll talk a little bit about that last one uh, about the contract amendment process. So if you've been through a grant before, you know how this works, but if you haven't, um, what happens is we have an agreement between us and your institution that the work that's on your proposal is going to get done by a certain deadline. And that deadline is really important because it's when we uh, receive the final report. It's when our agreement technically ends and it's where we then send the final payment to you. Um, if you wind up with uh, selecting the wrong final semester, and then you put in a proposal that has a different semester in mind in the end, and the timeline doesn't line up. We'll often catch that, but every so often we won't. And there's there'll be an Excel sheet, and it will list all of everybody's final semesters that they selected, and then we're using that to write out the uh, service level agreements. So be sure that your final semester is correct and it lines up with everything else. Uh, otherwise, it's going to wind up on the contract, and then you have one more chance to pick that out and say, wait, the deadline's wrong. Oh, OK, so we've got a question from Jonathan Beers. It says, back when talking about separating impact numbers by course, is that referring to separating impact on college algebra from impact on quantitative reasoning? Um, or is it as specific as separating numbers for impact on college uh, algebra for one section from impact on college algebra in another section? I think this definitely depends on your team. If you're all going, if you all are currently using the same commercial textbook and you have a price on that, and then you are going to zero cost across um, all of the courses that are going to be affected, then that's what you've got. You've got one price that uh, students used to pay. You have a zero cost now. And so students are all going to be saving the same exact thing. Um, if you have a, 
thing where you've got a department-wide implementation, you may want to be uh, as uh, as broad as doing an average cost of the textbooks around the department. Uh, if you've got like six different professors in college algebra who are all using different texts, but then when this project happens, they're all going to be at zero cost or at uh, $25 a student or something like that. Uh, you could then do an average cost of the commercial textbook affecting a certain amount of students. What we really don't want to see uh, is what we've seen in the past where um, we'll see maybe four or five different courses listed. Then we'll see how many students have taken all of those courses on average per semester. But then the total textbook cost is something like $800 and we go, why is this an $800 textbook? What textbook is $800? Well, it's the sum of all four courses, uh, and therefore students are taking, uh, at some point, all four of them. Uh, that doesn't really work. We want the cost per student uh, per enrollment in a course. So I think for the most part, you want to have one answer per course. So one college algebra, one quantitative reasoning. But if you have college algebra where uh, you have six or seven different professors who have different textbooks and are going to therefore generate different student savings, do an average textbook cost for that course. Does that make sense? OK, thank you. It's a tough one to explain sometimes. It, it really depends on uh, the team and the circumstances. And if uh, anyone who is watching this um, live or otherwise, if you are having trouble deciding on like which to do or deciding on how to separate things, feel free to reach out. We can help with that. Feel free to reach out on anything, but um, we do know that this this uh, whole separating your courses thing is uh, can get very confusing sometimes. So do we have any other questions? OK, um, well, uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, and like I said, we will have this video and the PowerPoint available on the round 18 request for proposals page um, later. Uh, it'll probably be tomorrow. Uh, once I get the captions edited and um, that is it. So I'm going to stop the recording now.